Hello, this is Al Black and my co-host Tim Conroy, and this is Chewing the Gristle. Say hi, Tim. Hey, man. How you doing, Al? My brother. I'm doing great. Our uh, guest today is the poet Clifford Brooks. Clifford Brooks is the founder of the Southern Collective Experience and editor-in-chief of the Blue Mountain Review. He hosts Dante's Old South on NPR WUTC and This Business of Music and Poetry. He has three books of poetry, The Draw of Broken Eyes and Whirling Metaphysics, Athena Departs, and Exiles of Eden. He currently bounces around Georgia writing his new collection, The Book of Old Gods. His poetry fiction hybrid, the, the Salvation of Cowboy Blue Crawford, is due out in spring of 2022. Clifford Brooks and his website, which you can see here on the page, is cliffbrooks.com. Welcome, Clifford. Thank y'all for having me aboard. It's a pleasure to be here. Okay. As you got your interest in poetry, was it early on and, and in that first interest of poetry, who were your early influences? Um, I have actually kind of a, I, I would think, uh, a unique way into poetry. Uh, for the first uh, 10, 12 years of my literary career, I only wrote fiction. Uh, I had an agent in New York uh, hear me on another program talking about my short fiction and a novel idea I had, and he contacted me by uh, email and wanted to see some of the some of those products. And that was back still when we mailed things, not you know emailed everything. And as I was printing everything off, I put it all in this envelope, and, and this just as the, uh, I, I, I honestly believe it's God. Uh, I had two poems that I thought were actually worth it, and he didn't ask for them, but I thought, hey, let me throw those in there and just see what happens. Uh, about four days later, his uh, secretary called me and said that he, that he really liked my fiction, but man, this poetry, they just, they really dug it. And if I didn't look at my phone and see it was a New York number, I'd have thought, who was trying to play with me? Because I didn't think of myself as a poet at all. Um, but having my foot in the door, I said, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. That's really where my hidden talent is. I'm glad y'all picked up on this. And she said, and she said, well, um, you know, Mark wants to talk to you more about this. And I'm like, sure. And of course, on the outside, I'm, I'm absolutely composed. And on the inside, I'm like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. So Mark gets on the phone, says the same thing. We really love the way you do your fiction, but this poetry, man, that's, that's, that's really where it's at. It has this Southern sound to it that we hadn't found anywhere else before. Do you have any more of it? Now, gentlemen, I have to admit at this point, I was at a crossroads where I could have told the truth and said, no, you've got all I got. Or I could lie through my teeth and say, I have a ton of it. And I decided to go the ton of it route. And I said, oh, my God, I'm glad you asked that. I have just tons of it. I've, I've had to sh shut down computers that's so full of my poetry. And he said, well, can I have about 80 more pages and uh, let's say Monday? Now, again, this is Friday. On the outside, absolutely composed. Yes, sir. You know, you sure you just don't want 80 pages? I can send you out 280 pages. Uh, he said, well, no, no, 80, 80 pages is fine. And so as soon as we get off the phone, I cried a lot, went to a dead, dead panic, but then thought back to what I love about poetry, and that's the storytelling aspect of it. I like the accessibility of it. I like the ability to have some elasticity in there and that the, the one reading can get into it, maybe see their own uh, life in it. But it's, you know, it's real world enough that they could actually get the lesson or the, 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 the feelings that I had in that moment. So the poets that I look back on that did that for me were St. Vincent, Saint Edna, Edna St. Vincent Millay, um, Robert Frost, William Carlos Williams, uh, Wendell Berry. Uh, and, and so in, instead of sitting down and rereading them because I was afraid that I would somehow take their sound into my sound, um, I took a step back and said, well, what do I really love about poetry? And it's the musical quality of it, the, 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 uh, the lullaby of it or the, uh, the, the quiet tone that it carries. So I turned on music instead. And uh, I realized that 
I couldn't do, I couldn't play music the way music makes me feel, but I, I maybe I could do that with words. And uh, so I sat down and over a very intense three day period of time, uh, started to hash out my life. You know, they say, write what you know. And so that's what I did. And um, thank God it worked. Now, now those first 80 pages I sent, I know, uh, I'm, I'm glad I can't find them anywhere because they had to have been horrible. But uh, over the next couple of years, I really just locked myself away for about three years, actually, before my first book was written and just learned my own voice. And that's how I got to where I am now. Well, that's, that's fantastic. So, Cliff, how would you describe your poetry style now? I've, thought, I've, I've had someone call it like Southern surrealism. Um, but uh, really, I mean, when I boil it down to its kernel, it's narrative poetry. Um, the, every poem I have, Typically, it's a journey that I'm taking, whether it's literal or met metaphorical, or uh, there are poems that I call like snapshot poetry, where I'm just sitting there looking at a scene, trying to figure people out, um, writing in my little notebooks what I'm, you know, just, it's me trying to figure out how the world translates uh, to me and how I can make that to other folks. So, I mean, I try to keep it into the, the, the area of narrative poetry. Why don't you read a couple poems? Okay. Let's see. I've got, here's one. It's called The Honest Oath of Our Shower. This shower is always warm. So wash off who came before. My water is yours. And here you'll never stand behind me, that cold tile at your back. I think, like love, wanting is eternal. Seldom found in one but both are born in you. I adore your honest hips, your bad habits, the midnight romps that get the neighbors riled up. But you're cute and convincing enough to keep the cops from coming inside. So which, which collection is that from? This is from Athena Departs, Gospel of a Man Apart, my second ma um, major collection. How about read one more, then we'll ask another question. All right. Um, this one's called July 4th Parade. On atomic hot asphalt, parade floats are an American obsession. Sweat bunches dad's underwear. Yellow chewing gum is stuck to his shoe. One of their children is broken loose. And mom, mom is barely there. She ignores family to sneer. Perky cheerleaders are murder. Back then, she was a siren in the days previous to the PTA. Football players and police throw cheap candy kids fight over. The band is out of key. Dad wants to go home. And mother, mother is slack-shouldered and bitter. Oh, that's beautiful. Hey, Cliff, can you talk briefly about um, the radio show Dante, Dante's Old South on, on NPR, on WUTC? I can. I, I love this story. So, so many of my stories are so goofy. Um, I had a real good buddy in uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee, which is where WTC is located, where we uh, uh, record the show. And he gave me a holler and said, uh, hey, we've got this little radio show uh, uh, program up here that wants to uh, – feature you and another band and I got up there and he drove me to the station and you know how your buddies always you're real good friends when they're about to pull one on you they've got that snicker and you start to get nervous like what are you what, what's what are you doing and I was like where what kind of show is this he's like oh no don't worry about it so we pull up at the station and he's like I gotta go get my kids and as I open the door he goes oh it's NPR Poof, pushes me out I'm like wait NPR I didn't, I didn't bring my NPR game so I calmed down and I went in there and and uh did the show and the, uh, the station manager up there, Richard Wynnum, uh, said to me, Cliff, I love your accent. And him being British, I'm not going to try and do it. But I was like, I love your accent. And he said, you need a show. And I, I didn't think he wasn't, you know, telling me the truth. But I figured, you know, in the moment, people say stuff. Uh, so in about seven weeks' time, when the, the, that yearly fundraiser ran out, he told, I gave him an email and said, hey, you really want to do this show? And he said, sure, come on up. So I was so ecstatic about it that I invited 47 of my best friends to come be on NPR. We all piled into the station. I could see him come out with his eyes wide open and kind of go, 
well, Cliff, what's your formula? And I'm thinking chemistry, like formula. What, what, what do you mean formula? Well, how you, how you going to do this show? And I thought, wow, I really should have planned a little bit more for this. I'm not sure. And so he had me calm down and we walked folks in one at a time. And um, Dante's Old South became, it, it's the, the emphasis of the entire show is to catch much like what you're doing in your show, um, the, the, the real side of writing uh, uh, and all art for that matter, from architects to yard, uh, land, you know, landscapers. Um, with the mo most of it being around the literary scene, but just bringing it in there, taking out the pomp and circumstance. And an hour a month, we get to sit in there and kind of find out how people tick. And uh, it's, it's caught on, and the show's been around for about seven years now. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Brother Al, I'm going to pass it back to you. <clears throat> okay. Uh, something all poets and all writers struggle with is revision. Mm -hmm. How do you go about your revision and is a poem ever finished? I love this question because uh, I honestly believe that there is as much effort that goes into the editing as it does into the, the actual draft of it. Uh, there, there are two camps, as there, you know, as there are two roads and everything. There are those who believe that the muse touches them and they put it on the page and it's finished. And maybe that's true. Um, I wish I had that gift. But um, no, I don't. I mean, because honestly, I, I, I find out that I figure out more about myself as I go line by line by line by line. Um, Larry Fagan, one of my favorite editors, had me in my early career sit down and write poems with only monosyllabic words. And what that made me do is it, it made me very aware of, of the sound of each line and being a huge, like I said, the reason I write poetry truly is because I want to emulate what music does for me on the page. Musicality is, is and balance is critical for me. So I'll sit down and I, I will, that muse will hit me and I'll write that poem out without trying to edit it because I'll never finish it if I do it in time. Let it cool off for a couple of days, maybe a couple of weeks and then come back and do that line by line edit. I don't consider, I don't consider it ever done to answer that question. Like I always feel like, you know, when I read it like years later, like, oh, I could have done better. Um, but reading it out loud um, is the last stage of the whole production process for me to where I can actually hear it out loud. Um, catching those little hiccups or where the line could be better and then knowing that I'm never going to be completely happy with it. But when I do get a contentment that that sound is where I want it to be, I'll leave it alone. Hmm. So what poets are you reading and who's really fueling and driving your imagination right now? Um, I love Robert Pinsky. I love everything that Robert Pinsky does. Uh, Melissa Studdard is another huge mover and shaker in my life. I love Jericho Brown's work more than I can explain. Um, Elizabeth Browning is one of my new favorites. Um, Robert Frost, like I said, when, when I, I don't, I mean, I think that Robert Frost is still grossly underappreciated, um, especially some of his greater works like um, Home Burial, you know, poems like that, that, that are just so soaked in real world emotion um, that you can't really get out of them. Those, those are the, those, that's really what drives me now. Wonderful. Uh, Jericho Brown is, is. And he's just, I mean, he's, he's and it's just, like, I mean, I don't, I mean, what I, it, when, when, when you find somebody that you, that's like a literary hero, then they end up being a fantastic person too. You know, they, they just, I don't, I know I'm not going to call out any other poets, but I'm not one of those who can, and I'm not being judgmental either, but when somebody has been a, an epic jerk their whole life to everybody, it, it's, it's hard for me to, divorce the person from their work and appreciate that when I know how, you know, how cruel they've been or, you know, it's something like that. So when you, you know, like Jericho Brown is just one of the most giving people. And I've met him several times that, that just, they want to help other poets get along. And, and that just means so much to me because the, when we close ourselves off from each other and don't want to share secrets or, you know, when we want to become, you know, get kind of our, when we become more ego than poet, I think that, that our art is lost. Okay. Can you share a couple more pieces with us? I sure can. Um, I have, um, this is from my first book, uh, The Draw Broken Eyes and Whirling Metaphysics, and it's called Unburdened. Wisteria winds its way up the colonnades of my family's ancient home. Easing past noon, I'm lost in my mind here, clearly with her. I want to think on our emigre status. She hears my heartbeat. Great uncle's roses unfurl. 
Across the street, bells ring hymns. Now they toll six. The bells are innocuous, for we expect no borrowed time. Wonderful. Wonderfully done. Thank you, sir. We've got another one here called from the same book called Orchid Incident. Evidence of a wicked man is in this woman's bath. Her lover's been long kicked out. She can be seen through one window. Condensation obscures her. A leg crests, then stretches forward. A bottle of rum, one orchid on a silver tray. Shot glass thrown back three times. Beneath a bare bulb, she hums as Strauss conducts metamorphosis. Wound around her ankle is a green dragon tattoo. That's, that's great. Cliff, let me ask you uh, to give advice to the emerging poet about working through um, mediocrity, trying to get better, sending stuff off that gets rejected, working to the point where you start achieving success. All those stages, give, you know, give some tips to the, to the poet working through that process. Well, first off, uh, the, I, I, I hear, and of course, I mean, I'm, I'm in the same boat. Nobody likes to have their work rejected. But then I think that that word rejection is so hardcore. I mean, unless you're actually dating this magazine, I don't see how you could be rejected. It's such a hardcore word. You know, it's like, I have been rejected. Your work has been passed on. You know, and the first thing that you need to realize is that you don't know who's doing the judging and don't take it personally. Um, you know, it may be that that magazine is full of that issue or perhaps the person sitting in as editor. You don't know what taste they have. You know, you, you know, you, to, to really find out who you are as a poet, you have to get out of your own head. You, you can't really create in a bubble. And what I mean by that is um, I did that early in my career um, where I, I did, I, I'd fumble around in the dark and I, I didn't have a, a writing group with me. And um, where that helped me is that it allowed me in, 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 in real time to, to, to develop that poetic voice that when no matter what it is, someone can read it. And it's not that it sounds the same, but they can kind of, they can almost feel you in there. They can know that that's you. Um, and that's just the constant practice of it. And you'll have many 4 a.m. moments where you'll be looking at yourself going, my God, why did I devote myself to this, this art? And it's never going to give back to me. Um, and I think those moments are, are crucial because you have to, you know, really look at your reflection and say, because this is what I was meant to do. Um, finding a critique group that uh, is on the same page, that, uh, that, that, that have members in there with more talent, that have more years on you than you that are kind to you and their, and their critiquing. Uh, that is a huge step in, in feeling secure in yourself. Not that somebody has to tell you that you're good, but just to give your work to those that you respect and they say, hey, I see what you're doing here. Keep that up. Uh, be open to criticism. Uh, don't, if you wanna go into a room and hear just that you're a genius, then you're kind of, you might be in the wrong profession. Um, you know, if, if you can't take any kind of criticism whatsoever, it's gonna be a lonely life. Um, it's, it's, and as you, as you begin to find that success and you begin to really get those big magazines that you love that accept your work and you get that tingle of, this is it, I'm starting to make it, don't let your head get too big. You know, keep, you know have that same group around you that's helping you write that once you say, ah, oh, I'm, I'm perfect at this, they'll go, no, you're not. Now come to your house and beat your head in. If you, you know, not literally, but they'll, they'll keep you, they, 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 they keep that, uh, that, that dreadful ego in check. Um, find out what works for you as far as a writing schedule. Um, sometimes the best times to write are when you don't feel like writing at all because there's something bugging you so bad that it's starting to clamp down on your creative process. So, you know, when I'm energetic and I get in there and I'm just ready to write, sometimes um, doesn't create the same quality of work as when I feel terrible about myself because I'm digging that thing out that more times than not, so many of us feel the same way. And that's what we need as a community of, of poets, you know, and, and to remember, I think, really is that um, people want to hear that it's going to be all right. 
they want poems that, that, that tell you to talk about when you're sad and talk about when you're brokenhearted, but they want to hear all, more, I think more than anything else, especially now during COVID and stuff, they, they just want to hear that, that, that life's going to work out, that, that, that when people can see your poetry and see that you worked yourself through a hard situation, that maybe they could take some of that and do it too. Hmm. Let me ask you to, to talk a little bit about your role at the Blue Mountain Review. Um, the Blue Mountain Review, uh, next month will be seven years old. Uh, and, uh, the, when the, my, when my company, the Southern Collective Experience, uh, was founded, one of the first things that the core of our group did was suggest creating a literary magazine. I have never been in the game of wanting to come in and, you know, you know, changed all the rules and, but, I, but I did want to create a magazine just like what I see here on your show and on Dante's Old South that same feeling where um, we have a component of it where people can go online and submit their short stories and poetry in all genres of literature, actually. Um, and we have a team of editors that do that. But then going out and finding those up and coming poets and then talking to some of those big names that haven't been asked some of the, the questions they've always wanted to be asked. Uh, so we made it uh, a hybrid magazine where we have, um, you know, literary, where we have interviews with, like I said, just with the, like with the radio show, we will go find anybody who's doing their, their, their career well and doing it with joy because to me, that's the highest form of art and then sharing that information. That's our biggest point is not like asking these folks the same questions they've heard and had to answer a thousand times, but get into the practical side of things. Like how did you get over um, this change in COVID? You know, how did you get past those moments of deep doubt and, and, and personal feelings of failure? And I believe that honestly is what's made the magazine catch on so fast, so quickly is that we, we again, we want to make art human again and not something that's unattainable and too far away to grasp. Yeah, I think it's a fabulous uh, online uh, magazine and I encourage people to take advantage and submit to it. Yes, yes. And, and, and right. submissions, submissions are always open. And, um, and again, like, you know, with our editors, I mean, you can also, you'll know exactly who's looking at your work to go look at their career and, you know, again, kind of, make those real world connections. Brother Al. Yeah. So a lot of what we're doing is, is, is with this interview program is, is our target is, is the poet, now, merging poets and established poets to see what other people in their craft are doing. Do you have practices or, or uh, books that you would recommend to a poet? On Writing by Stephen King. I think that that's, that that's one of the first ones that I read that I'm like, I could, this is absolutely useful. Um, I think the rule that sticks out that he, he put down that is this gospel is that write it and then cut it by half. And he's talking about fiction, but I think it goes for poetry just as well. Robert Bly's Leaping Poetry is probably, as far as poetry is concerned, the one book that's done the most for me and that I would suggest to anybody. Um, Whereas on writing was far more of the technical side of things. Bly is as well with leaping poetry, but it, leaping poetry kind of imbues that magic quality where you don't need to be so literal and kind of re kind of, for me, it helped me, you know, make those leaps and what, how I describe things that as a, a whimsy to the poetry where sometimes it could be too heavy. Hey, hey Cliff, uh, let, let's dig into the craft a bit. Um, your craft, how important is family? is faith, your geography, to your poems. Those are, I don't know how you do this, if maybe you knew off the top, those are the three most important things uh, to me. Uh, it, it's, you know, the, the idea of poetry, how I capture that's a big deal. I mean, again, because in some of my poems, I'll write how I get creative, but my family is, is what moves me. Um, I've not had the most uh, fantastic love life, so my family has always been there. And that's what I try to capture in my poetry. In my first book, again, like I, I touched on some of those, but in my second book, um, getting more of the, the poetry road beneath me and experience beneath me, I felt that I was able to tackle some of these big feelings about my family. And to me, they're some of my favorite ones. Faith, um, the Lord, I never get preachy. I think that that puts people off immediately that when they feel like you're being, you're talking to them from the pulpit. I always talk about how faith has, uh, has, has made me a better person. And in the last two years, I've invested myself in my faith and I've seen it, um, it increase everything positive in my life. And so I try to find a new way to explain that to folks that 
maybe make them not, you know, want to choose my faith, but maybe consider their own faith and how they feel about that. And maybe they should take another look at, you know, how, how they live their lives. In terms of poetic elements that you tend to use in your poetry, what are the ones you tend to use and what are the ones you tend to avoid? Um, <clears throat> cliche. Uh, I have a poem. I'm an alcoholic and uh, I wrote the poem in a very sing-songy kind of, uh, it's, I, don't, I use a lot of interior rhyme. I, like, I feel like it helps the, the reader pull across, but in this poem I had, I stuck to an end rhyme, kind of what you would, uh, like what a parent would read. You, like again, in a, a lullaby that, 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 that kind of tricks the person into this harmony that's real melodic and very happy, but what I'm talking about is dour and, and hard and difficult. It's as much for me to put that on paper because when I, you know, when I decided to face that, and decided to make that known to the world, I, I didn't want to scare them away. Because I mean, there, it, for anybody in this battle, I, I wanted them to feel safe in the poem and those who have, don't know anything about it to be able to also connect to it. Um, so really staying away from cliche, staying away from uh, shock jock type of language. I think that, you know, I do have swear words in my poetry. Um, I have some great editors, but I always let my mom read it for, you know, last so that, you know, anything sounds too ugly. She'd be like, baby, come on now, you know, better words than that. Um, but so, you know, and, and not doing the angry blaming game, you know, I mean, and, and that's what a lot of people read reading poetry and, and what can typically push people away. So what I try to do is to, 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 to stay true to form and, and not try to fall back on uh, what's sticky or what's popular right now, because people are going to be disengaged from it because it's not true. Uh, that's I, I dig that uh, that you know the best poetry the best voices are authentic yes and your poems ring with authenticity and that's part of why i think so many people like them um al do you have another question before i ramble to my next one um <laughs> uh, actually when when you write and sometimes you know i try to write every day and sometimes i just i'm stuck what do you do when you're stuck to become unstuck i'll typically go for a run uh uh exercise a long walk uh, i used to think that well i'll pick up some books of poetry and i'll read it and what i end up doing is like god i suck at what i do these people are so great it, it almost makes that worse uh, so I'll find that, I, you know, what I need to do is get out of my head and do something absolutely not poetic. And every single time when I'm, you know, when I'll get outside and run and start focusing on one foot in front of the other, that, that, that thing that I'm looking for will pop up. And then I'll have to keep repeating in my head and try to run back to the house to get it down before I forget it. Um, but as far as like, you know, the schedule, I think I mentioned some of that before. There are, there are folks, again, that, that I think there's many different kinds and ways to write poetry as there are poets. Um, but I, I don't try to adhere like to a gospel extent, like sit down at this day and try to write this much. Um, uh, but if, you know, so I, I'll take some days off and let my mind just kind of wander, but I'll make sure though, that I don't go too far the other direction and then lose that, lose, you know, the direction completely. And therefore that, that edge that I have in writing. So I try to, you know, walk that careful balance between nature and the actual nurture of the work itself. Okay, hey, Cliff, tell us about the projects you're working on now. They sound real interesting. Um, it's uh, the, the, the book, a book that's much like the ones I have out now that are individual poems is called The Book of Old Gods. Uh, I used to say that my books are like, what I guess I don't have any children, but I've heard parents say like, you know, I have kids and I love them differently, but just the same, you know. I, I felt that way until this new book, I got into a fantastic uh, writer's critique group that uh, about a year and a half ago um, when I felt like I'd hit a wall, you know, God takes care of us. You know, I really felt like that um, I was kind of writing the same stuff over again. And, and uh, I ran into some great folks, you know, Robert Walton, Zach Riggs, uh, um, Hunter Carl uh, that, that sat down with me and, and I, I broke loose of that bubble and began to write this, this new poetry with this new energy and a new confidence uh, that now I have to say, uh, my books are sitting next to me and I almost want to whisper it like they can hear me say it, but this book is really like my favorite thus far. Uh, sorry, boys. Um, but uh, aside from that, 
there's this, uh, it's a poetry fiction hybrid called The Salvation of Cowboy Blue Crawford. And I've been working on this beast for about eight to 10 years. And um, it's, it's kind of, it's been my segue back into writing fiction uh, because I, I didn't know how much I'd missed it because I do so much storytelling in my poetry uh, that I get that, still got that kind of shtick, but I just, I, I missed the dialogue and I missed that, 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 that ability to, to just, you know, to, to tell in that show so much. Um, what I did notice, and I'll throw this in as, a, as a side note, uh, I used to laugh at people that said, you know, to be a better fiction writer, uh, you should try studying poetry for a while. And it's absolutely true. And I think that that's true because when I went back to the Cowboy, the Salvation of Cowboy Blue Crawford and wrote the fiction pieces, I immediately noticed that I do, even in fiction, I make a much more careful choice of words as I go along, not trying to waste any space. And so all of it, it's, it's a, the, the, the epic uh, poetry hybrid of Cowboy Blue Crawford. You know, it's, it's very autobiographical, um, uh, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it's been noticed by quite a few people already just because it's kind of new. And it's, 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 it's all about, you know, cowboys and Indians in a, in a, in a current day setting across the South from Texas to up to Georgia. Um, and so it's, it's me able to kind of expand my horizons and, and really ex and explain why I love the South so much and all the little eccentric, eccentricities that it has. Liv, how can our listeners get hold of your books? Um, you can go on Amazon. They're on um, Barnes and Noble. Uh, just you can Google them and you can, you can find them anywhere on the web. And um, let's get you to read a couple more poems. Okay. Um, here we go. Written during a seminar. I awoke untied from the earth. Silence is tenuous at 6 a.m. Children are louder than garbage men. My drive to the office is a brick to the brain. Work is there, but I am a stone. Half listening to the business of business, it's lost. Um, Been there. Yes, and that's what this, that's what I say. I, got, I was I worked D, uh, with DFACS and social services for ten years, and I've got a lot of those um, you know office sitting. I would rather be anywhere else kind of ideas. Um, here's one uh, about my family home called Three Nights at the Plantation. At eleven years old, my great aunt gave me coffee. Staying overnight, I slept on the screen porch, coddled in that gentle dark. Waking, breakfast, it felt like the life of a prince. Extracurricular criminals, we plotted on leather couches, smoked where Civil War soldiers once stood. An unmentionable evening made from semi-automatic weapons and maker's mark. A blue lady filters through, then saunters across the room. Dead come here. A house breathing, an unfeeling brick speaks at night. Ghosts watch us sleep and whisper gibberish. That's awesome. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, the subconscious whispers all the time. That's wonderful. All the time. All the time. Uh, is there? So... We want to thank you, and uh, this is Clifford Brooks. He's a wonderful poet. He's also the host uh, of Dante's Old South on NPR at WUTC. And if you like what you're hearing, I'm sure if you tune into his program, you'll he hear even more of this. So thank you, Clifford. Thank you. Thank you for having me.